Please be seated. A bit about waiting this week, don't we? I mean, I don't know about all of you, but personally, I have a moratorium on refreshing my news browser more often than once every hour. And even then, it was really hard for me. So you can see why this was a hard thing for these bridesmaids. They were ready. They were dressed up for the party. They had their lamps lit. The door to the banquet hall was right there in front of them, and they were there. That groom should have been there. He should have been there long before midnight. So no wonder they fell asleep. No wonder their lamps went out. It's that parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids. It's one of those parables. All we need to know is in the title. And then we think we have it figured out and we know what it's all about. Be prepared, be alert. God could be coming anytime and we don't want to be caught out. This is a very, very popular interpretation and it seems like it's pretty straightforward. It's in fact what kept the Puritan work ethnic work ethic, sorry, cranking on overdrive for generations of Christendom. Now, I understand the point as it applies to camping and of course disaster preparedness. It always sort of seems like it was a bit unfair when it comes to the kingdom of God. I mean, why would a God of grace? and love and mercy shut so many people out on what pretty much amounts as a technicality. I mean, they were there, they were ready. They were the ones that were on time. The bridegroom, that was the one that was late after all. Now, I have to admit that I often stumble over these kinds of popular interpretations of parables, especially when they rub up against the good news that I've come to know in Jesus Christ. I mean, wasn't Jesus's life and ministry all about welcome? It was about making space for the poor and the downtrodden and the outcast. And aren't those the very people who weren't always popular enough to have a seat at the table? It feels like those were the ones that God was calling out to. So what do we do with this parable? Well, in Godly Play, which is a curriculum that I taught with children for years and years, a parable is said to be like a box with a lid. We can't always tell from the outside exactly what the parable looks like. And it doesn't always just open up on the first try. But you know what? We're taught that we have to keep coming back. We have to keep peeking under that lid and one day, the parable will, in fact, open up for us. They say that it is, in fact, quite easy to break a parable. In fact, easier to break a parable than it is to go inside and begin to wonder about all that that parable really actually contains. David Hansen, on the online blog Pathios, encourages us to do exactly this. He challenges us to open that box and to dig deeper into this particular parable. He says that we need to sink into all of that discomfort that we have with the parts that don't actually make sense to us. And we need to set these side by side with everything that Jesus said and did in his life and ministry. So we need to look closer at things like, well, those wise bridesmaids, for example. I mean, yes, they were wise. They brought all that extra oil, but they were also pretty stingy, don't you think, when they refused to share their oil? Earlier in Matthew's gospel, Jesus himself says very clearly, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So what is going on here? And why is their behavior being celebrated? And you know, the other thing that I really struggle with is it's a lamp. A lamp casts its light without regard to individual users. I mean, surely all they needed to do was to double up. 
and everything would have been fine and there would have been plenty of oil. What they really needed was a little bit less self-righteousness and a little bit more creative problem solving, at least if you ask me. Now, I fully admit that this runs contrary to the moral that we are used to taking away from this particular parable. But the reality is that the only thing Jesus actually says in a straightforward way in this passage is keep awake, keep awake. And you know what? That's the one thing that all 10 bridesmaids fail at. They all fall asleep. I mean, from that perspective, none of them has anything to brag about, really. What Hansen points out is that every one of us has times when our flame is running low. The real failing, he says here, was of the community of believers. I mean, without a brightly lit lamp in every last pair of hands, both those wise and foolish bridesmaids felt like what they had wasn't enough. They didn't have what it took to wait it out together. And you know what? If they had done that, if they had doubled up, yes, they might stumble. They might feel like their flames struggling to stay alight. But you know what? They didn't even know when the bridegroom was coming. They might end up in the dark together anyway. At least they would have all been there and together when the bridegroom came. So how many of us are feeling like our flames are struggling to stay alight right now? How often do we as individuals and as a community of faith feel like we don't have enough to do what is being asked of us? After digging in around in this box of a parable, I think it might be telling us that for God, we are enough. Just stay faithful and stay together. Some of us may not have enough oil in our lamps, but you know what? Some of us do. Even if it gets very dark, God is coming for us and we have each other. If ever there was a time when I needed to hear this, it's right now. When I sent an email last March out to my former congregation, telling them that we were suspending our Lent soup suppers, never once did I think that I would find myself in the position of planning online Advent and Christmas. All of us has had to adapt We've had to problem solve over and over again. We've had to persevere. We've had to pray. And we've needed that energy just to get the next day, that presence of God. Sometimes it's more than just a day. We found it's been a week. It's been a month. It's been a year. And it's likely to keep on going for a while yet. All of our flames are low. So for me, this passage holds a message of hope. We are enough. Stay faithfully together, even in the dark. Christ is coming. In fact, it sounds like the perfect message to ponder as we are moving closer and closer to Advent. Now, I want to share with you this. It's one of my all-time favorites children's books. It's called The Dark, and it's by the ever-quirky Lemony Snicket. Now, I usually read it in person in Lent, and I feel like this year, in fact, now is the moment when I need to share it with you all. And you know what? Thanks to the generosity during the time of COVID of little brown young readers, I'm allowed to read it to you all online. So let me pull up my computer, just a second. All right, this is The Dark, and it's by Lemony Snicket. Laszlo was afraid of the dark. The dark lived in the same house as Laszlo, a big place with a creaky roof, smooth cold windows, and several sets of stairs. Sometimes the dark's hid in the closet. Sometimes it sat behind the shower curtain, but mostly it spent its time in the basement 
All day long, the dark would wait in a distant quarter, far from the squeaks and the rattles of the washing machine, pressed up against some old damp boxes and a chest of drawers nobody ever opened. At night, of course, dark went out and spread itself against the windows and doors of Laszlo's house. But in the morning, the dark would be back in the basement where it belonged. Laszlo would peek in at the dark every morning. Hi, he would say. Hi, dark. Laszlo thought that if he visited the dark in the dark's room, maybe the dark wouldn't come visit him in his room. But one night, it did. Laszlo, the dark said in the dark. The voice of the dark was creaky, creaky as the roof of the house and as smooth and cold as the windows. And even though the dark was right next to Laszlo, the voice seemed very far away. What do you want? asked Laszlo. I want to show you something, said the dark. In here? No, said the dark. Here? No, no, said the dark. Downstairs. Downstairs? Yes, said the dark. In Laszlo's living room was the biggest window in the house. Laszlo looked out at all the dark outside. Above him, the roof creaked, and he closed his eyes. Now the dark was all Laszlo could see. No, no, said the dark again. Not there. Down here. In the basement, asked Laszlo. Yes, said the dark. Laszlo had never dared to come to the dark's room at night. Come closer, said the dark. Laszlo came closer. Even closer, said the dark. You might be afraid of the dark, but the dark is not afraid of you. That's why the dark is always close by. The dark peeks around the corner and waits behind the door and you can see the dark up in the sky almost every night, gazing down at you as you gaze up at the stars. Without a creaky roof, the rain would fall on your bed. And without a smooth, cold window, you could never see outside. And without a set of stairs, you could never go into the basement where the dark spends its time. Without a closet, you would have nowhere to put your shoes. And without a shower curtain, you would splash water all over the bathroom. And without the dark, everything would be light. It would never know if you needed a light bulb. Bottom drawer, said the dark. What? Bottom drawer, said the dark. Open the bottom drawer. Thank you, said Laszlo. You're welcome, said the dark. By the time Laszlo got back into bed, the dark was no longer in his room, except when he closed his eyes to go to sleep. The next morning, Laszlo visited the dark in the basement. Hi, he said. Hi, dark. The dark didn't answer, but the bottom drawer was still open, so it looked like something in the corner was smiling. The dark kept on living with Laszlo, but it never bought him again. So where are those little light bulbs? little lights in the darkness that we need to find right now. How might God be calling us to serve faithfully in this time? Whose gifts would we miss out on if we thought 
that they weren't enough. And which light have we been asked to share as part of this community of faith? These are the sorts of questions that all of us are struggling with right now. Yesterday, our bishop gave her address to the diocesan convention and she opened up with these words, who knew? You see, this time last year, she was just beginning her journey with us as our bishop and she invited us on pilgrimage together. She told us travel light, stay in balance and have the courage to be lost. And who knew how much these recommendations would need to actually be taken to heart. Now, I am sure that there were many moments when Bishop Lucinda herself was tempted to think, I do not have what it takes to lead these people in this time. But you know what? Instead, she brought us together. She did her first ever virtual bishop's visitation right here with us in St. Philip's. Now, I'm sure that you all had your doubts. I'm told actually that if it wasn't for the bishop's visitation, some of you were tempted to just try and wait it out, canceling church until we couldn't meet again in person. But you know what? Instead, you all figured it out together. You figured out how to gather and worship over Zoom with Bishop Lucinda, and you continued doing that. This past year is a microcosm of the whole wise and foolish versions, their struggle happening over and over again. It's a story of all of us stumbling together in the dark, but then deciding that as for us, we will serve the Lord together faithfully and we'll do it with whatever fuel we can muster up amongst ourselves. Bishop Lucinda closed her remarks yesterday with the words of Mordecai to Queen Esther. Who knows, but perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Her challenge yesterday is a challenge to every one of us. We are called by God to serve together in this time. It may be dark and our la lamps may be low, but you know what? We have what we need. Double up, stay awake and stay faithful. There is light even in this interminable darkness, and Christ is coming. Amen.